Um, so working with them to, to learn how to, uh, you know, write embedded Elixir um, was fairly easy, which was a nice thing. Um, and then on top of that, the fact that all these web development tools in terms of like testing and continuous, uh, continuous delivery, continuous integration, that sort of stuff already exists for Elixir, we could do a lot of that with our hardware. Um, where, and also, since Elixir has a growing web presence, things like SSL and uh, you know web sockets and, and that sort of thing that you think of, uh, those are kind of tricky in embedded C, at least in my experience. Like I said, if you're an expert, you may say, oh, well, I know how to do that already. But um, you know, it wasn't as smooth in embedded C as it was to do an Elixir because it's already there um, from the web community. Yeah, that's really cool. So still another answer, right? So there's a, a vertical slice of a problem that was really important to you that was embedded, but you needed to do that without significant friction right. um, with the other places that, you know, that other, other languages solve really well. Right. Um, I know Neil even has a different answer. Yeah, so for Pylon, the conversations that we build are kind of go against the grain a bit with Alexa and Google Home. So they're multi-turn uh, stateful and all this other stuff that makes the per request very expensive and complicated. And there was just no way to simplify that or optimize it in Python or scale it as it turned out. So we had to switch to something that would let us get more nuanced solutions. Yeah, so I heard a couple of things there. The first one is um, stateless, um, easier to reason about, think about as the complex problems were coming in, but also the, real, the raw scalability of when you, can, when you have a process that's free and that thing can, can sit around a while, um, then you can kind of keep those connections open. Um, I, one of the, the, cool, um, the cool moments for me, I guess, was about three years ago when... Um, Chris McCord and Jose were um, looking over this this graph, and I said, uh, uh, charts. And he says, well, you don't understand, Bruce. This is um, Ruby. This is, you know, he was talking about languages. And I said, well, but wait a minute. That number on the left is, that's, that's in the tens of thousands. And that one on the right, that's 2 million. And he said, no, we didn't get quite to 2 million. We were just short of 2 million. I said, 2 million what? He said, chat connections in a single chat room and that spike that you see there was when we broadcast a 4K Wikipedia page to everyone in the room, right? And, and then, you know, and then we said, well, okay, um, what, was the, what was the response time? And he said, well, for which user? It was never worse than four seconds for any individual user. And we were all just kind of sitting with our mouths open, um, just wondering about the possibilities. So, yeah, so um, five really dramatically different answers, you know, from, from beauty to raw scalability to a vertical slice of a problem um, um, to, you know, programming paradigms. That's, that's really cool and really different. When programming paradigms change, they're usually around one thing. Like when, when object-oriented programming popped, it was all about Java and internet programming and deployment, right? So this is interesting and pretty new. Um, let me stop for a second uh, myself and see if anybody else has some questions for the panel. Okay. Uh, my name is John. So um, I hear a lot about stuff for Elixir about uh, servers and stuff like that. So as a full stack dev, I have to do front end and back end stuff. So what can Elixir do on the front end and if it can't do anything, then why should I choose that over just doing JavaScript on both sides? You know, it seems to me that one language is easier to use than two. <laughs> it's a good question. So why not JavaScript? <laughs> I don't know. If you want to spend your life doing that, go for it. <laughs> like, I, like, <laughs> like, I don't have, I, I don't have a. <laughs> He's if, being if so what? diplomatic right now, guys. You can see it. I, I can give a weird answer. 
Yeah, no, you come back to okay. me. Give me, give me a second. I need to workshop this. Okay, so, <laughs> um, so Chris is trying to be polite. Chris is, um, is uh, probably one of the biggest typing experts in the room and one of the biggest testing experts in the room. And um, so one of the reasons that you would do um, like a Lixer on the back end, uh, there are scripting, um, there are scripting um, solutions on the front end that look like Elixir, but let's not talk about them right now, right? On the back end, um, there are some compelling advantages related to the failover, related to the shape of the problems you solve, related to, to concurrency and error handling um, that, that allow you to achieve um, more volume, more stability, and dramatically reduce your costs. I mean, those are, those are the main reasons. Yeah, so basically what I was going to say is if I could write Elixir on the front end, I would do that, right? So on the back end, you have an opportunity to use whatever language you want. You have a lot more choice. And it's an opportunity to, to do that, right? So you can have a functional language. Um, and I would reach for that on the front end if I could as well. So one of the things that's happening on the front end is that um, there is, um, you know, usually when there is um, discontent, um, in a programming community, what you'll see is um, a few key people leave the room and start working on um, other languages and things. And there are a lot of promising frontiers, nothing with enough critical mass. But really, the basic idea is that um, until the tool chain is ready, JavaScript script is becoming um, the pre-compiler on the front end, right? And then you would have a, um, a language that sits on top of that. Um, WebAssembly Web as well, yeah, yeah. And that's the tool chain that I was talking about. So anyway, um, if the problems that you're solving are um, similar enough and they're well suited for JavaScript, there's no compelling reason to do something else. Um, but there are things that could push you in different directions, um, you know, distribution, scale, um, many, many things like that. I have, a, I have a balanced answer now. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so I'll just say, I mean, here's the thing. Like, you can make anything scale if you want to, like, spend your time doing that in your life, right? Like, you know, people, like, what, Craigslist is, like, three people, and they spend most of their time tuning Perl and MySQL. It's like, they'll make it work eventually. Uh, if you really like JavaScript, Good for you, um, and like you'll have no shortage of jobs, and you can use it on whatever platform you want because it runs everywhere. Good for good for you, um, and, and that's great. If that's like what you're optimizing for in your life, like sure, go for it. Like th there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, I my kind of hot take on it is I think the role of the full stack engineer is dying. Like I don't think it's a role that's going to last much longer. Um, definitely within the scope of like the majority of us in this room, our personal careers, like I think we'll see that die away because you're, too many things are commoditized at this point. Like you can just commoditize a backend system. You know what I mean? You can, you can get to that point. So, uh, I, you know, there's nothing wrong with, with doing that. The reasons to not do it are being forward thinking about your career in terms of like where you want to specialize because you will have to at some level if you want to like continue progressing in your career, unless you want to do consulting for the rest of your life, um, which is a, which is a good life. You can do that. Um, you know, that's what it turns out. Most companies don't outsource their core competencies, so that's not that fun long term. Um, but you know, you can you can certainly make a career at that. The other thing is just like I mean, maybe you want to like learn a different backend language because you have specific problem sets. You have a specific thing you need to do or you, know, you want to solve a specific problem, or frankly, you just want to make yourself a better developer. You just want to learn something because there's an intrinsic um, importance in trying something new and in learning something new because it will change the way that you approach your job and approach your, your career choices and approach the decisions you make in a, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, for me, I do Elixir all day, every day. That's my job. I love it. I wouldn't. There's no other language, no other runtime I've used that's as stable, as scalable. Um, but, you know, I mean, obviously your mileage is, may vary. I'm not going to, you know, I can tell you my experiences with it, but I, I can't necessarily convince you to do it other than just telling you the good experiences I've had with it. His answer was way better. 
following up on that, just a real short thing. In general, for professional development as a developer, if you haven't worked with a functional language at all, um, I would recommend doing that, uh, no matter the language, uh, because the paradigm shift allows you to see problems that I think at a, like a different level of abstraction, where you, even when you go back to an OO language, um, I think like being able to think both ways makes you be able to understand like what's at the core of the computation problem um, from a computer science perspective as opposed to just like how do I specifically do it in the language that I know. So um, that's one reason if you don't know a functional language and you want to learn one, Elixir is a great one. Yeah, so that's one of the things that we're doing with the conference that's coming. Um, we have Gig City Elixir tickets go on sale today. Um, we have um, two people who are not Elixir programmers. One is the second um, in the Closure community, Stu Holloway. Um, one is one of the founders of the Haskell programming language. He's coming all the way from Sweden. His name is John Hughes. Um, and the reason that we do that is that every time that you see an excellent programmer in whatever language, when you see how they apply their tools to their trade, it changes the way that you code the language that you use every day. Question right there? Yeah. So um, I work mostly in Node.js nowadays, um, but I've come from a background of many different languages. And one of the benefits of JavaScript being a mess is that it's multi-paradigm. So when I worked through a scheme book with some friends, um, I took some functional techniques from that and it made my JavaScript better because I could write things a little more elegantly. When you're working full time in Elixir and you're in a purely functional paradigm, do you find, what sort of things, let me say, do you find yourself reaching for from like object oriented programming where you're like, I'm in a functional language, but if I could just do X from object oriented or procedural, it would be easier. So if there are any examples of that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. Um, so the thing, the first thing that people struggle with, or at least that I did, was state, right? Like you just want to assign stuff. And I should point out that <clears throat> Elixir is not 100% purely functional because you still have things like assignment, right? So you still, have, it's easy to, to use local scope. Um, so yeah, that was, that was the, the hardest thing. Like I just want to shove something in a global variable and have it be available in all these functions. Like what's the problem, right? So you have to, you do have to remap your brain a little bit. Um, and then you have to reach for other things, other tools like agents and things like that. You can spin up and hold state. But one of my favorite things is that it forces you to, to think about state differently and maybe you don't need it as much as you thought. I would say that there are two things that, um, that I think about when I think about object-oriented development and functional development. Um, one is that um, you know, every, every developer has kind of the glue um, that they use to hold concepts together. And with object-oriented development, that glue is wrapping this shell around a stateful interior, right? With Elixir, that glue is transformations. Um, what, what was interesting was Jose saw a, um, an ML construct called piping, which is also a Unix construct, right? Is you do a directory and you pipe it into, you know, print or whatever. And, um, so he grabbed that construct and really didn't use it too much. And it wasn't until Dave Thomas wrote his book that the pipe symbol took on more significance. And he said, this helped me change the way I think, right? So that became the glue. And the other thing is that um, I think that in object-oriented programming, there are certain problems. Well, actually, object-oriented and procedural programming, there are certain problems where um, state change is really important for good performance, like certain types of number crunching. You know, you're a data scientist. Um, a lot of the data sciences are better in Python um, than Elixir for, for that very reason. So those are the things. I would also, I would also say, like, w along with the OO thing, like, so much of OO and like doing OO quote unquote like well 
is, is this notion of like decoupling, right? And you focus more on, okay, well I have these objects here that are decoupled, they contain their own state, and the only way to get to that state is to send messages, right? That's like, that's like what a lot of our best practices push us towards. The cool thing about Elixir is th the unit of computation in Elixir is a process. And the only way to do, any and the only way to have state is to have a process. And the only way to do anything with that state is to send that process a message. And so, like, in many ways, uh, and in fact, Joe Armstrong is like, he loves saying this, like, uh, he, he loves sort of saying that Erlang is the only true OO language. Because you actually enforce the boundary layer, uh, and you have to send messages to communicate, which is just good OO design anyway. Right, you have, you have the, the parts that you liked from OO, OO with none of the nonsense. Um, you know, some people try to recreate that nonsense. I have seen that, but. Uh, so. <laughs> um, I have two questions, and they're both about adopting Elixir. Um, the first one is like championing, championing a new technology in a company. How do you, uh, how difficult has that been with Elixir, and how do you limit the bus factor? And then the second one with related to adoption is just like Elixir DevOps, like Heroku has been really nice and it's not as nice on Elixir. So, I mean, that stuff. So maybe that's a too big. So the first question, um, how do you champion um, a new technology in, in, um, in a company, particularly a big company? Um, so this is a really big problem right now because the industry um, knows for the most part, that we need to move on from where we are. And in many cases, we just can't. We have monoliths, um, we have uh, skills, skills gaps, um, and the problems that we're solving aren't pressing enough um, to kind of push us over that edge for the most part. Now, there are a couple of exceptions. Um, there's, there's a story in the Adopter Elixir book from one of the co-authors, his name is, is Ben Marks, and the story is about their adoption of mobile technology. So they went from a place where it was a pull model where somebody says, oh, you know, I just heard about um, LeBron getting traded or, you know, Kevin Durant getting, getting traded or, you know, different, different events. And what would happen is they, they would hear from different media sources and then they would, uh, you'll kind of filter into the site and you could have, um, you know, kind of a gentle wave of, um, of hits on, on the website, right? With mobile, that's a push notification and they all come at once. And their servers would heat up to a dull red, melt down and die. Um, so they had to move um, and the pain got so acute that, um, that they basically um, started looking around um, Elixir was, was a great new alternative and, and um, the, you know, from on high they said you will make this work because if you don't we don't have a company. Um, so part of adopting Elixir is about um, finding the right problem. Part of adopting Elixir is carving off a small enough piece um, that, um, that you could succeed or fail and not blow the whole company up. So those two are a conflict. Um, more. I guess for me, I think um, it's going to be really hard to convince a company who they have money on the line, people's jobs on the line, um, without like kind of some proof. I, if your if your problem I think is hard enough and like warrants all like like you're saying like we have all these millions of of notifications coming in, we can't handle them. That's I think that's an easier sell than let's be forward thinking and and get off antiquated technology. I think a thing that's going to help is building up the Elixir community and making it vast and making it not this niche thing that someone's just coming to me and, and trying to present it as a viable option, which it definitely is, but they're not gonna see it that way until we have that, that mass. So I'm, I'm for getting more community members into Elixir, educating them, having it be something on their mind because if Developers Lowering the risk, yeah, right? Yeah. So, Everything that we do just lowers the risk. When we yeah. when we create frameworks like the Razor framework, thanks, Greg, it lowers the risk. When we um, when we put on conferences as a community, it lowers the risk, right? And when people see the increasing res uh, risks of missing this this important programming paradigm, 
um, and the decreasing risks based on the availability of local talent, you know, with pan panels like this one, um, it'll help. And this is not just about Elixir. Elixir is just, just happens to be the local community that we have. This is about the new um, explosion of the functional paradigm across all programming. I can talk about the deployment question unless somebody else. Um, so I think deployment is kind of a temporary problem. Um, it's gonna be addressed soon. Uh, releases are gonna be built into Mix pretty soon. So they're aware that it's a problem and they're working on it. Um, in the meantime, Heroku is, it's okay. Like, you don't gain all the things that you should gain from working. Like, it's a compiled language. We should not be shipping code, right? Uh, and it shouldn't be that hard to set up, especially with what Heroku is. So, uh, thanks for mentioning Razor. Uh, I wrote an app generator for Phoenix, and it comes with deployment out of the box. Makes it really simple. It's got all the build packs, and it's set up for Circle CI. So, in the meantime, you can use something like that, and it's, it's not that painful. Uh, I know Chris has been through the full Kubernetes setup, and that's pretty rough. <laughs> but there is a plan to make it better. Weeks of my life <laughs> are just gone. Never to get them back. What DevOps problems are you having? Yeah, we use we use uh, we still use Heroku for a couple things, um, and it's been okay. But you do the thing that I uh, that I find uh, that you fight a lot right now is just that you know our our classic ways of like deploying things fight the benefits that you get from Elixir. Like I mean, like it you just they don't want you to have stateful applications. Um, they don't want um, shared resources, right? Yeah. And um, I mean that kind of blows up a lot of the distribution infrastructure. Yeah. And um, your second question, I'll let you ask it again. That was really that good. I, I did as well, well, actually. Yeah, he, champ he champ helped champion it at Pylon. He came in and talked to our CEO. Uh, we did a shootout for a microservice and tried to get everybody to use the language that they wanted um, and JavaScript for some reason. Um, <clears throat> and Phoenix and Elixir tied for first place as far as things went. Um, and Clojure was the other one that won. We'll have a weird gut reaction to Clojure that kind of took that off the table. And we ended up choosing neither of them at the time, but the way that we made it work as a company was everybody on the back end does Elixir, right? So that we just, we hard cut over to building the new platform from scratch in Phoenix and Elixir and solve the deployment stuff. We still trip over it every now and then, but um, we don't use the hot code reloading and some of the other pieces that make it harder and so we just have Docker containers, same as everyone else, that pull in environment variables, same as everyone else. That's great. So we have time for one more question. Um, I hate that this is the one I'm ending on. Um, so someone, uh, I think maybe it was Chris, was talking about how like um, someone's like, you know, in a language enough. They, you can make something happen whether or not like it's necessarily the best thing to do. Um, so I kind of have a question about like the best tool for the job or whatever, right? And with any tool, the, the more you come to use it, the more you learn its limitations and like the pain points of that particular tool. So my question is what sorts of, like for C, for instance, like most people aren't gonna say that writing like pthreads in C is fun, right? So like, what sorts of things in Elixir are pain points? Or, or you're actually like fighting against the language to do it that you come across. Like, why wouldn't you adopt Elixir? I've got well, I've got a mic here, uh, but the um, the first thing, speaking of C and hardware, like I've sort of been.
focusing on, it's not real time, or you know, not. It's some people say Erlang is soft, or I think officially Erlang is soft real time, but then like still. You have, that is a strong limitation if you're in the embedded world. So it, you just have to keep that in mind. I think the limitation I came across, it wasn't necessarily Elixir, but it's something that like the Elixir community had adopted as part of like the norm was like using Ecto. And it's good for some things, but then if you need to do more complicated SQL querying, like it really falls apart. Um, and so there are workarounds for it. But that, that was one thing that I was just like, ooh, this is, not the, this is not great. And thanks for not outing me for being a Mongo shop and fighting <laughs> Ecto. Oh, I just outed myself. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think, like, like uh, so um, I, I, there's ways to get around this problem. Um, but I mean, just you can't really solve the problem of like the beam, the, the, the VM that Erlang runs on is just slow. Like, it's just really slow. Like, it's not slow on the scale of Ruby and Python. Those are really slow, like really slow. But, um, but like generally, like the beam's not fast when it comes to, to, to like heavy, heavy, heavy computation. And the way that we get around that is you either, um, what you end up doing is you end up building, using Elixir or Erlang as almost like a control plane. So you can, um, you know, s like send data out to your, your fast like Java thing or your C thing or whatever. Um, and so you end up sort of wrapping, wrapping it that way. And that's what we do. We actually, we built out a whole ML pipeline using Elixir, but Elixir is just the control plane language. And we call into Python scripts and just run Python scripts for people. And uh, it's much faster because of that. Um, and, but fault tolerant because we have Elixir managing all the communication process, stuff like that. So, uh, but like if, if you're really, really CPU bound, like based on, cause you're like trying to crunch like Fibonacci or something, like, then you know you're, you're going to have a worse time than if you were doing it in closure, <coughs> Haskell or something. So the whole spirit of seven languages in seven weeks is to do something non-trivial in a language so that you can find out what each language is good at. So that's the best question for this book. Um, <laughs> so who asked a question today? Uh, put your hands up high. There's something's at stake here. There's you asked you ask a, question. a question, yeah. So. Um, <laughs> Any of you interested in a beginning Elixir book? Okay, so uh, one of you two. So the best question of the two on <laughs> panel. JavaScript guy. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ironically wonderful. And um, bad, so bad JavaScript guy. <laughs> the, the best question for the two, I'm going to say for adopting Elixir, that was the ideal question. So um, I don't have that book in my hand, but um, get with me after. I'll give you my email address. and. JavaScript guy, really sorry, uh, yeah. Other one. Re really, um, really sorry and congratulations at the same time. <laughs> Think of it like a self-help book. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was, that was an excellent question. Well, I think uh, I'm gonna pass it over to Anna to wrap us up. Yeah, um, cool, sorry, that's fine. Uh, yeah, thank you guys for coming. Um, the next meetup, it will be posted on our meetup page, so check that out. Um, I'm not exactly sure who's speaking next. Sorry, this is like useless information. Enjoy your day. Thanks for coming. And <laughs> Gig City Elixir oh, yeah, tickets. Our conference is October the 26th and 27th. The tickets go online today. We wanted to announce it here so Chattanooga people had time to sign up first. We're only opening up 80 tickets to start with. <laughs>